different astronauts from four different countries. And it's just something really special when you think about we've all come from very different backgrounds. We have different cultures and different traditions, but we share those with each other. Working as a team, we can back up each other and accomplish the mission easily. And I hope that this is something which can show the world uh, how we can achieve big things when we cooperate and we work together. It's a human being's instinct to broaden our boundaries. Humans have always wanted to push the boundaries. We're curious beings. We want to know what is out there. We want to see what's behind that hill. We want to see what's behind that sea. We want to see what's behind that planet. Every time we've explored in the past, it has been beneficial to humans and to humankind. We always learn and develop technologies that help us learn more about our home planet. We travel out into space to gather knowledge, to expand our understanding of our world and the universe, and return that knowledge to the Earth, to humanity, for the benefit of us all. Welcome to the International Space Station Flight Control Room at NASA. Welcome to the International Space Station Flight Control Room at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, where teams work around the clock to monitor work and life aboard the Orbital Laboratory. Mission Control Houston is essentially the nerve center for operating the International Space Station, working in tandem with our partner agencies and providers around the globe. Together, we've ensured the station is ready to welcome Crew 7. Leading the team inside the room right now is Flight Director Chris Dobbins. He will lead the joint NASA SpaceX Go No Go polls once we're in integrated operations with Mission Controls here in Houston and SpaceX in Hawthorne, working together to bring Crew 7 to its new home in space. Like many launches to the International Space Station, today's launch has an instantaneous launch window, meaning the crew must launch at exactly 3.27 a.m. Eastern Time to line up with the space station. Launching at that time, puts us in an orbit where Dragon's thrusters, which don't have the same power as Falcon 9, can carry Crew 7 the rest of the way to the space station. When Crew 7 arrives at the space station, they will no longer be referred to as Crew 7, but rather as Expedition 69 flight engineers. They'll be declared Expedition 70 once the Soyuz MS-23 departs in a few weeks with NASA's Frank Rubio on board. He will land September 27th with the longest single space flight by a U.S. astronaut with 371 days in space. Space. Once on board, Crew 7 will conduct a direct handover with Crew 6, and Crew 6 will remain on board the station until their scheduled undocking day. A direct handover also helps ensure a continuous U.S. presence on the space station, a record approaching 23 years in duration. After docking and hatch opening on Saturday, Crew 6 will give Crew 7 a safety briefing and orientation, which might be particularly helpful for the first time space flyers on this flight, NASA's Jasmine McBelly and Roscosmos cosmonaut Konstantin Borisov. As the station is first and foremost a laboratory, the crew will jump right into conducting experiments with new research still to be delivered on upcoming cargo flights. For now, we'll send it back to you, Daryl. All right, thank you very much, Courtney. Back here at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Looking at pad 39A, the rocket and the spacecraft that will go to that destination. That Courtney just gave us an update on the International Space Station, which of course is flown from Mission Control in Houston. Give you an update on what's happening out the pad. We've got the crew inside. Give you an update on what's happening out the pad. We've got the crew inside the Dragon spacecraft. They are buckled in, plugged in, ready to go, had their comm check, com checks completed. And right now, the closeout crew is making their way, finishing up their work and making their way out of the launch tower. Space see there. Closeout team has departed the crew arm. So that means they're out of the crew arm. You can see them going down the, going down the steps to the elevators and then back down to their vehicles to clear out of the blast danger area. There you see their vehicles awaiting them, the three Teslas that took the astronauts to clear out to the launch pad. They will take the closeout crew out of the perimeter of the launch area 
and they will stand by at an area a good distance away one from the launch pad. We're one hour and 41 minutes and counting until liftoff, and as we look at the pad station. and think about uh, traveling to the International the Space Station, we talked about the crew and how they'll be performing Let's many groundbreaking now science now experiments. Science Let's take a closer look now at some of that science they'll be doing. The International Space Station is a the International Space Station is a state-of-the-art microgravity laboratory that is unlocking discoveries not possible on Earth and helping us push farther into deep space. Every single day we are answering big questions about Earth and about space, about where we came from and about where we're going. But the other thing that we're doing is we're learning more questions to ask. Microgravity turns almost everything we know upside down. Liquids behave completely differently. Fire burns in new ways. Biological systems reveal surprises. There's a few things that have made me gasp out loud up on board space station watching heart cells actually beat has been a pretty big one. We're studying ways to grow food in microgravity. I gotta tell you, these, uh, these are pretty amazing. We're learning how human bodies react to life in space and how to keep crew members safe and strong on long-duration exploration missions. Deadlifts are awesome on Earth. They're also awesome in zero gravity. We're testing technologies that will be critical to our return to the moon and great leap to Mars. Our research has contributed to medical and social benefits on our home planet, allowing us to find new ways to combat disease back on Earth and develop technologies to deliver clean water to remote communities in need. The spectacular vantage point of more than 200 miles above our planet supports our monitoring of Earth's climate, natural disasters, and plant life. The orbital perspective that we have here on the ISS is just absolutely amazing. Earth is gorgeous. The growing new space economy, so vital to our continued progress in space, is flourishing in low Earth orbit. We're inspiring future generations from a platform that is one of the largest international collaborations of our time. We're doing science at 17,500 miles per hour. Come along for the ride. A great uh, overview of Jessica, some of the uh, science being done on board. And Jessica, you've uh, looked into this mission, of course, as an astronaut with the yourself. Astronaut Corps you, and a scientist yourself. You're pretty curious about some of the science that's uh, going up uh, on this uh, mission. Yeah, we talked about some of the experiments already, the cipher physiology and psychological experiment, the sleep in orbit experiment. There's another one that I find particularly interesting. It's called it's called um, ISS external microorganisms. So this is a really cool one because for the first time we're going to be taking samples during the spacewalk to determine whether or not the space station releases microorganisms through things like life support vents. So we'll be swabbing and collecting these samples to try to understand how far they go, how many of them are there, how far they travel, and get a good idea for what it would be like. In particular, if we think about going, for going forward and being good stewards, now, I like to think about when we travel, we need to be good stewards of our planet. So if we're going to the surface of Mars one day, we need to understand what kind of contamination we might be having and what kind of effect we might have on that planet. So this ex microorganisms experiment will help understand a little bit more of the impact that we have. And to me, that is the ultimate experiment because it is, a, it is science and a spacewalk at the same time. Oh yeah. My two favorite things. So if I could knock both out at once, I mean, that would be... A Incredible. double winner right there. And so they're going to like yeah, actually like swab like the outside of the space station. Yeah, they're going to going to collect those samples during that spacewalk. How about that? Now, what are these vents so that you're talking about? Like like what are they venting? So, you know, so some of the vents are for the life support system. So you know we are introducing an atmosphere into the space station to give us the air that we need to breathe. And so there are some vents associated with life support systems in general, stuff that that is off gas or released to the external environment. Out into space. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And so you're wondering if by chance 
there there could be some microorganisms out right. there growing, right. which would and just be blow my mind oh. if right. there were. Right. right, and perhaps rapidly evolving in the space <laughs> environment. How about that? And Fascinating. And as a scientist, Jessica, you, know, you, 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 you know, you did a lot of work early in your career. You talked a little bit about that. And it calls back to an experiment that is worth mentioning now that had some amazing results. And when you were working on this experiment, it even got a catchy name called Mighty Mouse. And I was wondering if you could uh, share a little bit of that with our audiences. You know, this is a mission to the International Space Station and science is at the forefront. You were involved in an experiment that had some pretty incredible results. Yeah, the Mighty Mouse experiment is one of my favorite ones to talk about for a couple of reasons. One, I'm a physiologist, as we mentioned, and so there's a lot of similarities between the work that I've done and, and working with animals. This experiment looked at, at the myostatin and activin pathways. So these are very important molecular signaling pathways that influence muscle degradation or breakdown. So on the Earth, the researchers involved here have identified these as very important for providing possible targets targets to prevent muscle and bone loss. So you can see a picture here. These are two of the mice in question, the Mighty Mouse experiment. I think it's pretty obvious to the naked eye, even without a scientific background, that they are very different. So what you have here is what we call a wild type mouse on the left, the smaller mouse, just the normal mouse. And then on the right, you have a Mighty Mouse. And this was accomplished in two different ways in the experiment. One, by creating a myostatin knockout mice. So this means that this my mouse actually does not have the gene for this pathway. So as you can see, this mouse, these myostatin knockouts, have two times the muscle weight compared to the other mice. So because you're blocking that pathway, degradation is not inhibited, and they have much more muscle on board. And you could feel that in the mice. When I was doing the experiment, holding the mice, you could feel how strong they were and how much bigger they were. Interestingly, when we treated another set of mice, again, just the wild, the normal mice, with a, a, a therapeutic agent, they also did not lose muscle or bone mass in space. What I'm pointing to right there in this picture, this is a bone densitometer. So we were actually putting the mice into this bone densitometer and imaging their bone density while they were on board the International Space Station to get these images, because we're looking at not only muscle, but also bone. These pathways are, are important for both muscle and bone. And why is this important? This is important for a lot of different reasons. First of all, here on the ground, we have a lot of different disease states that have different types of bone loss or muscle wasting, muscular dystrophy, osteoporosis, heart disease, any kind of disuse wasting of the muscle for like elderly people or bedridden people. And if we can understand more about the mechanisms involved in these pathways, we can help those patients. And the other interesting thing about this experiment in general is that it also has applications to space. You know, you saw a video earlier of us exercising in space, incredibly important part of our day. We have two hour blocks on our schedule because if we don't exercise every day, we will have significant muscle loss and bone density loss. We have these really large systems on the space station, these exercise pieces of exercise equipment to keep our bones and muscles healthy. But when we talk about going back to the moon, going to Mars for long periods, of stay, we won't, we'll have smaller capsules. We won't have these big pieces of equipment. And so we might need to employ some of these strategies that we're learning about on the International Space Station. So that's why this, this experiment is such a favorite of mine. It really touches life back here on Earth, helping patients with various disease states, also is applicable to the future of space travel as well. And even I'll cap it off with a really interesting story of the investigators. Si Jin Lee and Emily Germain Lee, they met back in college. Si Jin was working on the myostatin pathway, the one involved in the muscles. And, and Emily, before she was his wife, she was already working on the activin pathway, the one involved in bone. And they realized, although they were working separately at the time, they had this very complementary system that worked in concert. And if they worked together, then perhaps they could solve some of these even bigger questions. They were incredibly excited. They had always dreamed of having an experiment of theirs fly 
in space, and they had demonstrated these concepts on the ground. So it was really cool to be part of this team and watch that experiment come to fruition and to have such dramatic results. Again, those mice that were treated with this therapeutic agent did not lose muscle and bone density in space, while the ones that were not, just like us, had dramatic losses in both of these. So really interesting to see that these uh, these agents were successful in space and the applications it might have for the future. And amazing that it was, you know, an experiment. Yeah, the results, of course, incredible. And they, they obviously, you can see them in the photo of the mice and, and how it turned out. But I mean, this experiment was right in your wheelhouse, right? Uh, you know, uh, th all of that came together, you know, both, both the scientists, you up on board the International Space Station as well. I remember reading you know, I looked into the study a little bit in preparation for the show, and the space is, yeah. was said as, you know, the ultimate bed rest, right? Yeah. Like, which is not good if you're trying to maintain that bone and muscle mass. Right, we need to make sure that we can bring astronauts back to be healthy, and when we think about going and walking around on the moon and Mars, we need to make sure that astronauts are healthy when they get there as well. My colleague Drew Morgan and I were super excited to be performing this experiment in space. He's a medical doctor by background and me as a physiologist, we were utilizing our own backgrounds and that was another one of the, the big contributions that we felt we made. And we even ended up on their scientific publication as well. How about that? Well, thank you very much, Jessica, for sharing that outstanding science. T minus one hour and 30 minutes and counting, we're awaiting the- T minus one hour and 30 minutes and counting, we're awaiting the launch escape health check. And then and then a few more minutes we'll get to our and uh, then, chief engineer. And then in a few more minutes poll. we'll get to our uh, chief engineer loops, technical poll. Marching slowly we won't hear that over the loops, the but marching slowly to mark the T minus one hour mark and until then activity will really start picking up. Question. Until then, I mean, them all night. Keep let's them take a social in. question. I've been mean, getting them all night. Here Keep them coming in. Hashtag Indiana Ask NASA. Jonas. Here we have at have Indiana item, Jonas. Jessica, <laughs> Do you have a favorite you. item, Jessica, that you brought with yeah, you to space? Yeah, I think we'll actually have a chance coming up here to show some of the items of things that I brought to space. So I won't spoil the surprise quite yet of of everything, but you know, a lot of times astronauts will bring pictures of loved ones, whether it's a physical picture or just something that we can bring up, a, sent up on a computer or an iPad. And we like to bring things that, that represent our different backgrounds for representing universities we went to, clubs that we belonged in, because you know, we, we've talked about it a little bit already, but you know, we, this is not just our mission, this is really for everybody. And we want to carry that enthusiasm and that excitement so with everybody to so show them that they are a part of it. So there are so many things you wish you could bring you know, more because our capacity is very yeah. limited. But you know, we have to think long and hard about which items we'll, we'll bring up with us. Well, let's talk about uh, that flight kit a little bit more. Each Crew 7 astronaut is allowed to bring a few personal items with them for their roughly six month stay in space. And we're holding your item Let's as a surprise. We'll talk about, uh, what they're bringing up. Let's take that left. crew shot and we'll talk about uh, what they're bringing Constantine up. You see all the way to the left. Konstantin Borisov, right. he's bringing up his son's Andreas first toy. Mogensen. Going left to right. Next is Andreas Mogensen. He picked the zero G indicator along with his children and he kept it a surprise. And so we're waiting to see that. We're going to see it float in space. We'll learn more about that in a bit. And then to his right is, of course, the commander. And then to his right is, of course, the commander. Jasmine Mogbelli. She brought two dragon stuffed animals, one for each of her twin girls. And she's going to show them floating around in space to her girls. So we're going to take a little video, send that to them. It's a touching thing to do for your young kids. And then uh, all the way on the right, Satoshi. He's bringing photos of his family and friends and photos of current students at the school he graduated from. 
floating around. Yeah, we take a lot of pictures of these items floating around the space station, usually in front of the in the cupola. So you've got the Earth in the background. And actually, it's difficult to get some of these photos sometimes. You get a little air and some ventilation, and an object gets caught in the ventilation. It's not, it's not floating exactly, just staying still where you want it. The light changes all the time in the cupola. So you have to kind of master out this system to get proficient at it to take these pictures because it can take quite a bit of time. But it's so important and so meaningful for the people back on the ground that we do our best to capture as many of them for the loved ones that we have and for everyone down there because it, it really does mean so much to everybody. Wouldn't it be better to have video rather than a picture of something floating yeah, around? Wouldn't it be better to have video rather than a picture of something floating around? Yeah, we do video too. Okay. But you're right. You're right. A lot of times it's just a, a still image that we have, but depends what you want to use it for. Great stuff there by Jessica Muir, NASA astronaut. Great stuff there by Jessica Muir, NASA astronaut. With us on the broadcast. Thank you very much, Jessica. And continuing to count down one hour and 25 minutes and counting until liftoff of Crew 7. You're watching NASA's coverage. When these astronauts go up to the International Space Station, they'll spend When these astronauts go up to the International Space Station, they'll spend about six months up there working scientific experiments that you just heard a few of them from our and astronaut co-host the and then they'll come back down and one of the, the traditions we've just started to see now is the astronauts coming back to the Kennedy Space Center to talk to the talk to the folks that help support the mission there's a lot of people here at uh, the Kennedy Space Center working behind the scenes to make those launches a uh, success Took time out of and recently it was the crew four astronauts that to took time out of their busy schedules to say thank you to the Kennedy team and we've got a look at that. It is a very surreal to drive around the grounds. It is a very surreal to drive around the grounds. Uh, the last time we were here we were in quarantine and so we were very isolated. Uh, we had got to have our families around us but we didn't really get to interact with a lot of people. But we could see all the hustle and bustle that goes on uh, in order to make it possible for us to launch. It is hard to imagine um, looking over at the big entry from here, um, thinking back to when we were sitting on top of a rocket. It is a, a pretty amazing place to be able to come back to. Kennedy really has a special place in my heart. I think it was really important to our, all of our crew to have this opportunity to come back here and just thank the, the workforce here, our team members that made this flight possible. You know, I think as we think about space flight, it is not anywhere near an individual type of accomplishment. Yeah, just absolute gratitude um, for the teams of people that just ensure our safety, ensure that there, there's always a, an eye looking over every piece, every detail, and ensuring that launch goes off without a hitch. So many of you have uh, been a part of that journey, your investment, um, your expertise, making us successful in our, in our work and getting us home safely. Uh, and we're, we're grateful for the work that you're doing. So it is incredibly special to be back here uh, and get to actually interact and thank all the people that uh, that contribute uh, to the mission and were able to get us off the ground uh, and bring us uh, bring us home. It's just an amazing place, just a, such a talented pool of people that enable such amazing expeditions to fly out of the Kennedy. So it's it's really cool to be back here and to get to to meet the people that uh, that are making all of that happen. You can really tell all those smiling faces just how much that meant for Crew 4 to come back and share their time and their words with uh, the team here at the Kennedy Space Center. You're looking live at uh, Launchpad 39A, the Falcon 9 rocket. And Dragon we'll spacecraft. We'll start fueling up the Falcon 9 at T minus 35, we'll minutes, at, uh, T minus 35 minutes and counting. Time. But in between this time and that time, got a few more milestones to go, including, including rotating that arming uh, the launch escape system, away. rotating that uh, crew access arm away, and 
then of course having the pole and then of course having the pole for the readiness to tank the rocket for the readiness to here, tank the rocket at, uh, this view right here you're looking at uh, gathered at the banana creek the special guests here, that have gathered at the uh, banana creek launch facility launchers. here on the kennedy space center Got launch watchers here. Which is impressive because it is got a big group Eastern here, time, which is impressive because it is 2 a.m. Eastern time. But it's always exciting to take in a crude launch when you know that uh, you've got astronauts going up on top of a rocket. And so they've all gathered pretty early in the morning here and pretty early in the countdown, minute, an hour and 21 minutes to go. It's great to see the crowd out there at the Banana Creek viewing site. At various Got about 6,000 people who are Kennedy at various center. viewing areas around Kennedy the Kennedy Space Center. Also got folks along Banana Creek is one of them. Also got folks along the uh, a causeway that's just across the water. From those locations, of watching got special guests. From those locations, of course, we've got special guests up at uh, building. a building we call the Operations and Support Jasmine Building. Hopkins up there, who We've got our own Jasmine here Hopkins up there who will be interviewing some special yeah. guests here in the they're final hour. And uh, they're joined by several hundred VIPs who are taking in the site from the fifth floor up there on the balcony. It's a great view up there as well. talked a lot about the different astronaut classes we talked a lot evening. about the different astronaut course, classes astronaut co -host this evening of course our astronaut co-host Jessica Meir of she's from the eight ball class our crew tonight, of 2013 the Lieutenant Colonel our crew tonight the, the commander NASA Lieutenant Colonel Jasmine Belly is the only NASA flight. astronaut going up on this flight it's a multinational flight many but she is one in group of many in and a highly accomplished group of astronauts selected in 2017 and nicknamed the I Turtles. But I think for me what's really special is that um, we all just come from such a diverse background, set of backgrounds and experiences. We have um, scientists, engineers, uh, people from, from all different walks of life. We're just really, really fortunate. Uh, the, the team that selected our class, uh, I think, just did an amazing job at really looking at, at how personalities meld together. That's what I appreciate the most is just the way that we're able to enable each other's strengths and lean on each other um, in, in ways that, that bring us together and bring us closer as a group. We all care so deeply about each other. We have such an amazing uh, relationship across the entire class and, and you know just what a, an amazing group of people. We've been able to really lean on each other and our expertise in different moments um, where, where it's most applicable. Jasmine is an amazing person. Uh, our class is incredibly close uh, and she is just an amazing leader, uh, an incredible pilot and a great choice to be the commander of Crew 7. And that's one of the biggest blessings of being up here for so long for me is I'll have flown with pretty much half of my class. We now have a continuous turtle presence in space, which started with Crew 3 when Kayla and uh, Raja launched, which we look forward to Jasmine carrying forward. So the turtles class in amazing class, they were the class. So the turtles class in amazing class, they were the class that was selected just after my class of the eight balls. And pretty cool that they have this kind of run of the space station right now. I remember when we were saying that about the eight balls, but 
Jaws, Jasmine, who will be joining her classmates Frank Rubio and Woody Hoberg on board. They are already up there awaiting for her. And then Laurel O'Hara will be joining from her Soyuz launch in the middle of September. So pretty exciting to have all of those turtles up there at once. And I know that's how it felt for me. Daryl and I were talking earlier about when I arrived on the space station and we had four members of our class all up there at the same time. And in thinking about it, I think I've talked about all seven of my classmates during this broadcast. You've seen photos of most of them in the previous coverage. And it just shows how we really do become like a family here at NASA in the astronaut office, especially with those classmates. We talked about my classmate, Anne McLean. You saw her as the astronaut support person on the, bad, on the pad, helping the crew with all of those final preparations. We saw Christina from the spacewalk footage from the spacewalks. Actually, we did three spacewalks together, Christina and myself during our mission. And you saw Victor and Christina in those Artemis images as well, as they are now in training for the incredibly exciting Artemis II mission. You saw some footage of Nicole Mann and Josh Cassida from their recent mission on board the space station. They were on Crew 5, so again, carrying that legacy with them. We talked a little bit about Nick Haig earlier as well. Nick was there on the space station when I arrived. And I talked about Drew Morgan just recently with the Mighty Mouse experiment. Drew was the astronaut that I was up there. Actually, I didn't spend a day in space without Drew. He was there for the entire seven months of my mission. I was up there for 205 days, so almost seven months. He was there already when I arrived, so he was up there even longer. He was had about a, a, a nine-month mission. So. There you have it, all members of the class. We've been represented in this broadcast, but it's not about us today, it's about those turtles. So more about them. We are so excited to see Jaws on her way, headed to join her classmates, Frank and Woody up there. You know, we have right now on the space station, the four crew members that flew up on crew six, of course, that's Woody Hoberg, Steve Bowen, Sultan Al Nayadi, an astronaut from the United Arab Emirates, and also Andrei Fedayev. They arrived on the Crew 6 vehicle, so they'll depart be departing about five, six, seven days after Crew 7 arrives. They'll have a handover period so they can really get accustomed to everything that's going on, hand over whatever information they need, and then they'll depart. And then we have Frank Rubio and cosmonauts Sergei Prokopiev and Dmitry Patelin. So this crew will be joining the seven crew members that are already up there until that handover period ends and then the four from crew six will depart. The Soyuz crew is scheduled to land, I think, September 27th. So Frank will finally be returning home from space back here to the U.S. and he his mission was extended, so he will have been up there for over a year when he lands. Finally, and he's gonna break the record, right? Uh, longest uh, That's right. continuous uh, stay in space. That's right, it has been an incredible mission for him, but of course everyone is very excited to have him back on the ground as well. And I'm sure he will be just as excited to be back, uh, back on Earth be able to visit his friends and take family, a and take a hot shower. Showers are always very welcome when you come back. You know, <laughs> you do get surprisingly, you, fi you feel very clean on board. I was surprised by it, but it's kind of like a sponge bath that we get up there, but you really do feel clean. And part of the reason why is you just don't feel as dirty as in space. You know, <laughs> not even your clothes are really resting against you when you're in microgravity. Everything's kind of floating. You don't go outside and get sweaty in the hot Florida humidity, like us sitting here in these chairs getting a bit hot. You just don't experience that because you're never sitting down. You know, you never, you don't. But you are perspiring, right? That you're, you're losing water through the skin, sure. just, but it's not sitting there, right? Absolutely. You still have all the same physiological mechanisms going on, but it's a temperature control environment, so you're not really sweating throughout the day aside from when you exercise, and then you do sweat quite a bit. Okay. And it's really cool to see because the water, it doesn't just fall down, doesn't fall off of you like it does here on Earth. It'll kind of accumulate until a force acts upon it. So you might have a ball of sweat kind of grow on your head, for example, if you're Victor Glover and you don't have any hair <laughs> up there, or, or Luca Parmitano on yeah. my mission. And 
yeah, it, it behaves differently until it'll come off in a in a you know with a Just once you have it. motion imparted on it, onto it. Great stuff from NASA astronaut Jessica Meir. Great stuff from NASA astronaut Jessica Meir as we count down one hour and eleven minutes until liftoff of Crew Seven from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. If you're here with us in the area and you want to hear the callouts live as they happen, you can uh, hook that up on amateur radio. The VHF frequency you can see on your screen, 146.940 megahertz. And on the UHF radio frequency, 444.925 megahertz FM mode. And you can hear that throughout the county here on the Space Coast. So we're a little over one hour until liftoff. So we're a little over one hour this until liftoff. And this is a continuation of regular crew flights to the International so we're a Space little Station over from one hour U.S. soil. Until liftoff. And this is SpaceX's Crew 7 mission will be the company's eighth crewed space flight for NASA following the crew we'll test flight SpaceX's demo two. Uh, it will also be SpaceX's uh, 11th crewed space flight overall, including the private orbital mission Inspiration 4 and Axiom missions one and two. Our crew at the very top. Our crew in the spacecraft at the very top in the spacecraft endurance. It will be the third flight for that Dragon that you see right there on top of the rocket. The Falcon 9 booster, well, that's a brand new one. The Falcon 9 booster, well, that's a brand new booster one. Booster 1081, M1D, on its first and flight. Impact booster 1081, M1D, on its first and flight. Back fuel bleed has started. Yeah, as they are reused more and more. Pretty cool to see. Yeah, you were talking about the booster, how, you know, in the reuse booster, you've got that sooty exterior on it, and uh, this is a brand new one. Of course, commercial crew program, they'll they limit the number of boosters in terms of their reflight for use on crew to to five. The endurance, its previous missions were... Crew five, crew three, today, crew, seven. crew five, and of course today, crew seven. If you're just joining us now, we've had a great countdown so if far. If you're just joining us now, we've Weather had a great countdown so far. Weather is go. nearly perfect. 95% go. Uh, a crowd of launch viewers on we've hand. got uh, a crowd of launch viewers on hand. Around the space center. At our various locations around the space center, more than six thousand people here in the local area, and of course, more than six thousand people here in the local the area, and of course, even beyond more. that, outside the gate, even more. Now we mentioned this once we get to an hour to go. Now we mentioned this once we get to an hour to go until liftoff, things will get start really that picking no up. No pole that will we get close to that go no go pole that will arm the launch arm escape system and we rotate and then the once that's away, armed and we rotate the, uh, the crew access arm away t minus we'll get minutes. the uh, propellant loaded into the rocket at t that minus 35 minutes for readiness happens at uh, t minus that crew one pole hour. for readiness happens at uh, t minus one hour to load the prop is at t minus 55 and of course the pole to load the prop is at t minus 55 minutes at t minus 45 minutes there'll be an internal mission control and Hawthorne pole load. and then the launch directors pole for propellant load I mentioned the crew access arm that'll retract when we get to t minus I mentioned the crew access arm that'll retract when we get to t minus 40 minutes close their visors and and the, the crew will get the call system. to close their visors and arm the launch escape system. Of course, once you have the of course, Falcon, once 9, you have with propellant, you want the Falcon 9 being loaded with propellant, you want a safety system that will allow the astronauts to get off the top of the rocket in case anything happens. And 
that automated what safety system is in place. Eight Super Draco thrusters. What makes it work are eight Super Draco thrusters that are on Dragon. The they would fire and, and they quickly separate the crew from the, the rocket. And they can do that or either on the pad on the ride uphill. or during flight on the ride uphill. And thanks for tuning in. Live launch coverage from NASA.
And thanks for tuning in. You're watching live launch coverage of NASA and SpaceX's seventh rotational flight of astronauts and one cosmonaut to the International Space Station from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. NASA astronaut Jessica Meir has been with us over the past three hours talking about Crew 7 as they have prepared for launch. Also talked a lot about science and a phenomenal number of other fascinating topics. We really appreciate you being here. We're now closing in on T-minus one hour until liftoff. And your thoughts on how we've done so far? Things have been proceeding nominally, as we say in the space business. Things are looking good. The leak, check, leak checks were good. Comm checks were good. The hatches are the hatches closed. I think we're in, in good shape. And the weather, what did we say? A 95% favorable odds for weather. So looking good. And I'm feeling good about it tonight. What about you, Daryl? Oh, I am feeling fantastic. And it's good. We both got the positive vibes going. You mentioned the weather. It's nearly perfect. Liftoff time still holding for 327 AM Eastern time and 27 seconds, if you're right down to the second. We're tracking no issues with the Falcon 9 or Dragon, as Jessica mentioned. The range is green. Weather. Good to go. Over the past three hours, we want to review now what our crew's been doing, and there you see them. Jasmine Mobelli, Andreas Mogensen, Satoshi Furukawa, and Konstantin Borisov. They have been getting ready to launch into space. Let's take a moment now to recap the overnight launch preparations. After waking up and having a meal, SpaceX helped the astronauts into their suits, as you can see right here at the historic quarters suit up room and the crew well once they got their suits pressure tested they walked right out of the same path that every nasa astronaut has done since apollo 7 waving to family and loved ones after getting inside their teslas with the gold wing doors coming down they joined a car caravan led by center security on a 20-minute ride to launch complex 39a big smiles Big smiles all around. All the way around. And then following their arrival to the pad, they got a look at their rocket, and in they went, walking across the crew access arm and right into their spacecraft. And those big spot smiles you mentioned, Jessica, we just saw them right there. Looks like the crew, they're, they're good to go. They truly are contagious, those smiles. It is difficult not to be smiling and excited when you know you are about to leave the planet for the first time for some of these, for, for Jasmine and for Constantine as well. Absolutely, and a lot of preparations have been brought to us at this point, including a dry dress. A lot of things have been going into this, so to get everybody ready, of course, we had a launch delay yesterday we stood down for that attempt, but now we're good to go, and we expect to be launching at 327 and 27 seconds our new T-0. All systems good to go for launch. Now we want to take, uh, have our team. SpaceX, you are go for Section 5. Wind ready, report go for launch. Dragon Tabby's go for Section 5. Okay, and with that call out at this time, we're going to expand our coverage. We'd like to welcome in SpaceX and NASA commentators joining us live from Hawthorne, California, where the SpaceX mission team is located. Welcome to Jesse and Leah. Thanks, Daryl, and hello to everyone watching around the world. I'm Leah Cheshire with NASA Communications. And I'm Jesse Anderson, an Integration and Test Engineering Manager here at SpaceX. Leah and I are joining you today from SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, as we count down to liftoff of Crew 7 just under an hour from now. And of course, Crew 7 is our seventh operational mission with SpaceX, flying astronauts for long duration missions to the International Space Station, but it also comes with an important first. Crew 7 is the first mission in which every seat in the spacecraft is filled with a crew member from a different international partner agency. Represented are NASA, ESA, the European Space Agency, JAXA, or the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, and Roscosmos. It's also the first time an ESA astronaut has served as pilot of Dragon, so Andreas Mogensen is adding that to his list of accomplishments. Dragon flying today will be making its third trip to station, having previously supported Crew 3 and Crew 5. And much like on those missions, our teams will be staffed around the clock in Mission Control, which is just behind us, to monitor Dragon and the mission, not just today, but throughout the entire mission, from liftoff to Crew 7's arrival at the space station, all the way through splashdown when the astronauts return back home to Earth. 
on console or headset in Mission Control are six keys. SpaceX copies. Crew 7 is go for launch. The mission director is in charge of the room and tasked with making the mission director is in charge of the room and tasked with making real time decisions to ensure mission success. The person that you may hear talking to the astronauts, which we just heard a few seconds ago, is the crew operations and resources engineer, who you'll hear us refer to as the core throughout the broadcast. And the four additional team members are focused on vehicle systems, including avionics, navigation and control, software, propulsion, life support, and communication with ground support teams. Apart from mission control, our Falcon 9 team is currently located in the launch and landing control center at Hangar X. With less than an hour until launch, they are settling in for final checkouts, propellant loading, and for launch. And of course, NASA has its own team members at NASA's Mission Control Center in Houston, Texas, who have been preparing the International Space Station for Dragon's arrival. They recently gave their go for launch and confirmed the station is ready to receive Dragon and the new crew. Now, upon liftoff today's flight to the space station will take almost 30 hours with Dragon flying autonomously the entire way. And just like autopilot on a commercial aircraft, the crew always has the ability to take manual control of the spacecraft if needed. It continues to be a smooth countdown, and we're looking good for an on-time liftoff. Coming up at T minus 45 minutes, the team will report their readiness for propellant load with a final go-no-go poll. In the meantime, NASA's Courtney Beasley is going to help us take a closer look at propellant load and launch go-no poll. Go-no-go poll is open at 55.80. Procedure 1.160. Thanks, Jesse. I'm here in the International Space Station Flight Control Room. Thanks, Jesse. I'm here in the International Space Station Flight Control Room in Mission Control, Houston. What we have our sights set on today is low Earth orbit, which you'll sometimes hear us refer to as LEO. This is classified as orbits around Earth that are 1,200 miles or lower. There are a lot of satellites in this orbit, including the Hubble Telescope, and of course, today's destination, the International Space Station. The space station's orbit averages at 260 miles above Earth, but varies based on its apogee or perigee, the highest and lowest points of its orbit. Being that the space station is 260 miles above Earth, crew members are too far away to make things out like cars, people, or buildings. But they can see other landmarks around the world, and the long camera lenses they use help them zoom in on familiar sites of our home planet. NASA astronaut Steve Bowen captured Cape Canaveral on Florida's Atlantic coast earlier this month near Cape Canaveral Space Force Station and NASA's Kennedy Space Center, where Crew 7 is launching from today. The contrast of the colors between the Indian River and Atlantic Ocean become much more pronounced from space. And here's a beautiful nighttime shot of the city lights of Mecca in the desert valley of western Saudi Arabia captured by NASA astronaut Woody Hoberg on July 26th. Human presence on Earth becomes much easier to see at night. And this final image was captured by NASA astronaut Frank Rubio of Vadima Lake, one of the largest in Argentina on May 7th. Each of these images are taken from the vantage point of the International Space Station that orbits roughly 260 miles above Earth. Satellites collect imagery of Earth, too, of course, but the International Space Station is unique in seeing these viewing opportunities because astronauts and cosmonauts can tell scientists on the ground what they're observing and what stands out in real time. We can't wait to see what Crew 7 captures, but for now, we'll send it back to Hawthorne. Jesse and Leah. SpaceX's ultimate mission is to make life SpaceX's ultimate mission is to make life multiplanetary. To get us there, we've been developing a fully and rapidly reusable transportation system called Starship, the most powerful launch vehicle system ever developed and designed to carry passengers and cargo to Earth orbit, the moon, and planetary destinations like Mars. In fact, earlier today, the team completed a successful static fire of our super heavy Booster 9, an exciting step towards our our next Starship flight test. But you have to learn to walk before you can run, or should I say fly, and our learning started with Dragon, designed from the beginning to transport both people and cargo to space. The Dragon hanging from the ceiling behind us was initially flown to certify SpaceX for cargo missions to the space station. 
Dragon launched to space in December 2010 and became the first private spacecraft to return from orbit. Two years later, Dragon became the first commercial spacecraft to deliver cargo to and from the space station and in 2020, as we remember well, became the first private crewed spacecraft to reach the International Space Station. Altogether, the reusable Dragon spacecraft has completed nine human spaceflight missions and visited the International Space Station 38 times. Dragon is capable of carrying up to seven passengers to and from Earth orbit and beyond. And these days, we are very much focused on the beyond. Now, of course, we already have explorers on the Red Planet paving the way for humans who will arrive in the future. NASA's Perseverance rover landed on Mars in 2021 after an almost seven-month journey. Its mission addresses high priority science goals and also provides opportunities to gather knowledge and demonstrate technologies that address the challenges of future human expeditions to Mars. These include testing a method for producing oxygen from the Martian atmosphere, identifying other resources such as subsurface water, improving landing techniques, and characterizing weather, dust, and other potential environmental conditions that could affect future astronauts living and working on Mars. Now, of course, Perseverance also brought along another passenger named Ingenuity. This is the first helicopter ever flown on Mars. There's Ingenuity being deployed from Perseverance and those historic flights that we've seen so far. When the time comes for human explorers, they'll have to take everything with them for a surface mission. Building bases or even cities on Mars will require huge amounts of cargo and eventually crew. So we're designing Starship from the beginning to carry hundreds of tons of cargo into space and be able to be refueled in orbit. Before Mars, Starship will play a key role in the exploration of the moon. SpaceX is providing the lunar lander, which will return astronauts to the lunar surface for the first time in 50 years under NASA's Artemis missions. With the ability to deliver cargo and people to the lunar surface, we'll be ready to help humanity build a sustainable presence on the moon and learn how to live off-world before the next step to Mars. Today, however, we are going a little closer to home, and the work we're doing on the space station also paves the way to Mars, but it takes place in low Earth orbit. As Courtney mentioned, the area in it includes any spacecraft that orbits at or less than 1,200 miles from our home planet. That's pretty close in comparison to our moon, which is almost 240,000 miles away, and is referred to as deep space. Deep space missions like future missions to Mars will challenge us like no spaceflight journey has before when we start looking to send humans millions of miles away from home. Long duration missions on the space station, just like Crew 7, directly inform how we'll plan to support the first humans bound for the red planet on missions that could last months or even years. So we really look forward to those human missions to Mars. And right now we're paving the way with today's exciting mission, plus through Artemis launches to the moon. For now, I'll send it back to Daryl and Jessica at KSC. Thank you very much, Leah and Jesse. And to keep our astronauts safe while on missions to the moon and Mars, NASA is working to understand the long-term effects of living in space. Earlier, NASA's Jasmine Hopkins caught up with NASA's chief deputy science officer for our human research program. One of the investigations launching on Crew 7 is nicknamed Cypher, and it will study the physiological and psychological changes in up to 30 astronauts. Joining us now to talk more about it is Kristen Fobb from Johnson Space Center. So Kristen, tell me about your title and the 14 different investigations that make up Cypher. Yes, I am the Deputy Chief Scientist at the Human Research Program and 14 research studies, all wrapped into one research complement called Cypher. What we want to do is study the impact of microgravity on bone, exercise, vision, behavioral health, and not only as individual elements, but how they all interconnect together. And not only do we want to study that, but we also want to understand the impact duration has on the human body and microgravity. This is going to be really important information for us for the Artemis missions and for Mars. Right, Kristen. And on that note, we have been studying in low Earth orbit for over 20 years now. So how is Cypher adding into that? Yes, 20 years. And we've learned a lot about the changes that happens in the human body in space. 
Plus, we also have learned a lot about the twin study that happened a few years back. So Cypher is just a build on top of all of that knowledge that we've gained so far, plus all of the technology that we have today, data analysis. It's a great time to start Cypher. It really is. And after the launch of Crew 7, how soon can we expect to get the data back from Cypher? Well, once we start getting data, we'll start processing it. And then when we start to understand some of these observations and findings over hopefully these 30 crew, it's going to take time because 30, 30 crew, it's going to be a lot of information, but once we start to find some, some interesting observations, we'll let you know. Absolutely. It will be well Back worth the wait. Thank you so much oh, for being here tonight, you, Kristen. It's my pleasure. Back to you. All right. Thank you, Jasmine and Kristen. We're going to turn it over now to Hawthorne, California and check in with our team at SpaceX headquarters for an update on the launch progression. Thanks, How are we doing? Thanks, Daryl. I'm Ronnie Foreman, a commercial sales manager here at SpaceX. We are coming up on just about 46 minutes until launch, and our teams are carefully moving through the process to lift off. A lot of preparations have brought us to this point today, including a dry dress rehearsal and static fire earlier this week. For those of you following along, you'll also know that we stood down from yesterday's launch attempt for additional data reviews. But for now, all systems are looking good for launch. So next up, our launch director will check in with the team for readiness, both for prop load and for launch. The seven SpaceX responsible engineers, often called REs, indicate that they are go by voting electronically. Launch director will also check in with the Dragon Mission Director, or MD, on the nets, and NASA Launch Manager to make sure we're, that they are ready to move forward as well. And as Jesse mentioned earlier, the Falcon and Dragon launch teams, as well as key NASA launch members, are in the Launch and Landing Control Center at Hangar X in Florida. On screen, you have that incredible view of the Dragon spacecraft with the crew access arm still in the service position. The crew right now is on board Dragon, waiting to get the green light to stow the crew arm for launch and arm the launch escape system. Great shot of our astronauts there. Once the launch director gives the go-ahead, we should get a good view of the access arm as it swings away from the capsule. The range continues to be go for launch, monitoring the clearance area surrounding our launch pad, as well as the air and sea space along the flight corridor. And at Kennedy Space Center, weather is looking good for launch. If you're joining us on the ground in Florida, you know it's just about 82 degrees outside with light ground winds. Overall, we are looking good for launch in just about 45 minutes with a 5% chance of weather violation. Right now, we are listening in for that readiness poll announcement. And right now, we are listening in for that readiness poll announcement and instructions to our launch team. Again, this poll is going to be the go or no go to move forward. With Again, this poll is going to be the go or no go to move forward with propellant loading for today. As soon as that briefing ends, we should see that crew access arm. As soon as that briefing ends, we should see that crew access arm, which you can see lit up on your screen right now, immediately start to move away from the capsule when that stow procedure begins. Coming up on just 43 minutes to launch. Coming up on just 43 minutes to launch. Great nighttime views of our Falcon 9 and Crew 7. Great nighttime views of our Falcon 9 and Crew 7 capsule there on the screen. SpaceX Dragon. Go ahead, Dragon. Go ahead, Dragon. We can hear 
hear the poll for a prop load and launch readiness. Uh, we can hear the poll for a prop load and launch readiness. We're just giving a call. And sorry, Dragon, I just missed the last of your sentence there. Can you please repeat? And sorry, Dragon, I just missed the last of your sentence there. Can you please repeat? Yeah, uh, from Dragon, we just missed the yeah, uh, from Dragon, we just pulled for The joint NASA and SpaceX teams have pulled go for LESR, propellant load, and launch. And MCCX and Hangar X, both control for all operators, and MCCX and Hangar X, both control go into lockdown at T-minus 45 minutes and will remain in that state until the launch cave system is disarmed. All operators are to remain at their console, maintain the stroke cockpit until MD confirms successful disarming the launch cave system following orbit insertion or propellant offload in the event of a scrub. For non-urgent, no-go conditions, brief to CE or LD, and they will approve aborting the countdown. For urgent issues affecting the safety of the operation, operators shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. Launch control will abort the launch audio sequence immediately and proceed into launch abort. At T-minus 10 seconds, launch control will be hands-off, relying on automated abort criteria for the remainder of the count. Operators advise the launch director whether structural breakup or fires imminent or occurring per Dragon manual escape flight rules. Launch control at this time, you may proceed with arming the crew arm for movement. Copy, proceeding to arm, crew arm for movement. And with that, we are moving forward toward launch. Propellant loading and with that, we are moving forward toward launch. Minutes, Propellant loading will begin in just over five minutes, but in the meantime, let's right, check back in with Daryl and Jessica. All right, thank you very much, Ronnie. We now have crew access and so arm retraction started. We now have crew access arm crew retraction. Access arm. So if you look in your screen, you can see there, the crew access arm moving away from the Dragon Another great shot of it there, articulating away. It takes about 90 seconds to two minutes to move away. And this is a critical milestone, Jessica, as that arm moves away, because now that means if the astronauts needed to get off that rocket for whatever reason, they could either bring the arm back quickly, and it can move, as I understand it, a lot faster than it's moving now, in the case of uh, an emergency egress, or they would move forward and arm the launch escape system. That hasn't been armed yet. So this is the moving and stowing of the crew access arm so that we can clear that away from the rocket and get ready to lift off. After that, Through access arm retraction complete. We're now waiting to hear that Dragon is go for section seven, closing the visors and arm the launch escape system. You are go for section six, close visors and arm launch escape system. Well, they changed the number, but it's the same. Dragon, happy go for section six, launch escape system arming. Same milestone. I hear from previous crews that this system arms the very loud thump, so they can actually hear that on board. Which makes sense. You've got those engines, the Super Dracos, which are right there next to their heads, right? You know, because you're go. Right, and sounds like that was Jasmine saying she was ready to arm, and that command can be sent from either the ground or the crew, and the crew is sending that command now to arm that system. And that launch escape system is, of course, the system that will propel us away from the rocket, the crew capsule itself with the crew inside, in the event of any type of emergency with the rocket. And that is, of course, a system that we hope to never use, but it consists of eight Super Draco thrusters on this Dragon vehicle that are used only for this abort. And we say we hope to never use it, we hope to not be in the situation, but we have had situations where we've had incredible in-flight tests, unintentional. For example, there was the launch abort for the Soyuz for Nick Haig's first launch in 2018. Pretty exciting event, dynamic time, but something that showed us how robust these systems are. It performed nominally and carried Nick Haig and Alexei Ovchinin back to safety. got the verification of the launch escape system now armed. You mentioned Nick Hague. As I understand it, he counts himself having gone to space twice. That's right, or at least one and a half. 
But this system is now active. They do that two minutes before loading of the prop, since that, of course, then does prevent, present a more risky situation with that prop on board. And it will stay armed all the way through orbital insertion. I've also been told by previous Dragon crews that you can hear the system of valves opening and actually even the flow of the fu fuel itself as it comes on board. The scenarios in which the launch escape system will be used. F-9 tanks venting for prop load in 10 seconds. Expect loud venting. There they are warning them about that exactly what you just uh, mentioned. Giving them a heads up that they'll be hearing those sounds. Yeah, Victor Glover was telling me it's a very noticeable process. You can hear the opening and closing of the valves, and there are these low hums and kind of a fluttering sound as that super cold liquid oxygen and kerosene fill those large propellant tanks, first on the first stage and then on the second stage. Must be pretty exciting to be hearing those noises knowing what that means and how much closer you're getting to lift off. This is pretty unique in the launch industry, right? Where the astronauts are inside the Dragon, inside their spacecraft, as it's being loaded with propellants. That's correct. That launch escape system.